Dudes with wrenches here. What are we working on today? Well, we're working on a $500 barn find abandoned car that's, uh, well, less than running. It's been sitting for about 20 years. Did, did I mention 20 years? We should probably put that in the title. Yeah, it's abandoned barn find 20 years since it's ran. Let's get her going. Oh, you put it in park. That's fine. Oh, wait, I don't know how to stop. I didn't stop that. <laughs> All right, it's in here. Yes. Now, to clarify, I didn't want to create too much clickbait here with all the abandoned barn find bought for $500 hasn't run in 20 years Mercedes. But the fact of the matter is, this is a Mercury Monarch. And in 1978, Mercury actually advertised the Monarch as a challenger to the old bins. A test of handling and driving comfort. 41 out of 50 people, American car owners might I add, decided this was a better car. Or at least they were paid by Mercury to say that. The commercial was kind of confusing, but this car was as good as a Mercedes in 1978. But I bought one, and this is an actual barn find auction sale, and I did pay less than 500 bucks for it, and it did get driven 20 years ago. So, so let's get this thing running and see if the better than a Benz really stands up over time. Now, the internet has told me the first thing you do when you get an abandoned barn find car, we're gonna keep saying that a lot, it really sells the idea. You gotta look in the trunk. You gotta pop that trunk open and see if there's any extra parts or spare things lying around to give us clues on what this thing actually might need. And all we're discovering so far is this car had mice apparently live next to a field, and also, this guy didn't go anywhere without a fresh set of drawers, because you never know when you're going to need that fresh set of drawers. Also, there's potentially an issue with this front end, you can say that tire is gonzo, but this shows a testament to they made tires better back then, because it's not even dry rotted. Now, I almost called this a Landau roof, but it is indeed a vinyl top. The vinyl tops were installed on these cars because, hey, who doesn't want to look like a four-door convertible? It's extra classy. It gives you that extra look of importance. I got fabric on my roof, so that means I paid more for this car to look like a convertible. Don't you know? Because I drive a Mercury, and I'm special, and I like rusty roofs. Now let's go take a look on the inside of this dirty bird and see what we got going on under that hood. Now, oh, looky right there, we got some hood wood. Hood wood to hold up that hood because the prop is long gone and that is problematic. Let's go find something to resolve that problem because I don't trust crusty hood wood like other people do because I don't need any more scars on the back of my noggin. There we go right there. A threaded piece of steel rod will get the job done every time. Well, depending on what you're trying to do with it anyway. Now for some of that movie magic. Pew! Alrighty. There we go. Lights and here we go. Let's get to work. Now, well, the help works on assessing what's all going on here underneath the hood, let's circle back around to how and why we actually acquired a 78 Mercury Monarch. Because, to popular opinion, this thing is not a pretty car. It's not a fast car. It has no pedigree. It has no reason to be restored and loved. And that's kind of why we actually like it. Now, when I saw this at the auction, I was bidding on some other things. <laughs> a 56 four-door 210, which I was willing to spend a little too much money for. And I came across this one and said, well, I'm going to lose that. I might as well buy something while I'm here. And this was marked reasonably under $500, and it was going to a scrap dealer as a non-runner. And all I saw was the potential of a Ford 302 small block, a C4 transmission, and a good dependable rear differential, and some front-end components that would definitely swap into a 60s era Ford I might already own. So on that note, the money was spent, the bid was taken, and we won ourselves a 1978 Mercury Monarch for the fair price of $425.
Oh boy, this guy just found himself another piece of hood wood in the side seat. Now he's got to go stick it under the hood because he can't trust a perfectly good piece of steel. Sometimes I wonder if this guy just squirrel, squirrel all over the place. He can't focus on what he's doing. That's the problem. He needs to just, come on, get in there and work on the car. Let's see it run. What are we doing right now? Come on, guy. Well, I guess we're staring at paperwork for a tire repair done back in 2004, so I guess that confirms the 20 years ago. But these papers are kind of nice to just be sitting on the seat. It makes me wonder if they were thrown in there because they were sitting around. What are we looking at now? Oh my, what is that? Oh, is, is that more under drawers? That's more under drawers right there. And a hammer. I'm beginning to wonder if this is less about being prepared and more about weird hobbies while you run through cornfields naked wielding old rusty hammers. I'm not really sure what's going on in here. All right, I guess we're gonna treat this like CSI Miami now. Let's start uh, separating evidence. Did I mention this car has a mouse issue? Oh boy, is that glove box full of only the most enjoyable cotton candy. Oh look, treasure paperwork for us to enjoy and try to figure out when this car was last on the road. Anyway, why do you have to touch everything? Just put some gloves on or something. That's nasty. Ugh, ooh, it's getting in the air. Makes, you, makes your mouth water a little bit just thinking about it. Just, you know, the tastes, the smells. Oh, it's, it's unsettling. It's probably really good for your lungs. That's probably why we don't breathe well. Just saying, you're not even wearing a respirator. Is there anything in this glove box worth actually looking at? What are we doing in here? I thought we were doing a will it run. This is, gets hard. This is how you know you're a car guy, or at least a treasure hunter, I guess. Because you're just looking in places that don't need to be looked in. Worth it, treasure. I got tools now. These are car tools I can use. I can trim my beard. I can turn some bolts. Worth it. Worth the can- Oh, there's a rip in the glove. There's a rip in the glove. Burn the hand. Burn the hand. We're done here. That is a lot of nasty stuff right there. That glove box was like a Narnia hole. It's oof. Kind of nasty. All right, we're back under the hood. Let's go look at the motor. Let's try to get this thing going. Come on. I don't know why we're looking at these fluids. These fluids make no difference. I get, well, it is important to look at the coolant because that'll let you know if the engine's already been froze. If it looks all oily in there, it's probably not good. You want to make sure it looks green, you know, like mutant green, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, mutant... Hey, where are we going? Childhood. It's my childhood speaking right there. That's what that is. You know, now we got to go check some other things. Brake fluid. We, we don't even know if it runs. We haven't even tried to turn it over and we're checking to see if the brakes are any good. I guess. Why do you keep putting your hands in things? Fluids aren't good for your skin and you just keep doing it. You just... Ah, oh, now we're doing some real man stuff here. Gotta put the clip back on the mask cylinder with your bare hands. This idea comes from testing mouse traps as a kid just by putting your fingers in them. Now we're gonna check actual vital fluids, see if it has oil in it. Now we know that if it's full on oil, that means it's ready to go. Oil means good. Oil means good. That's right. Well, this oil's definitely full. It hits right on the line, crazy enough. It's really, really thin, and it just reeks of tarnished fuel. So he's gonna ignore that right now, and we're gonna move on to other things like, does it have transmission fluid? Because if we do actually get this thing to run, we don't wanna burn up the transmission because there's no fluid in it. Forethought is important before you dive right into disaster. Good call. Maybe reach down in there and actually see if the motor turns. That's probably what you should have started with, but all the other things we've done for this point have been very, very important. I'm sure of it. Now put all those ugga duggas in there, just with the corners of your hands, twist all your fingers until they hurt, and then you'll know it moves ever so slightly. I saw it. It moved. I felt it with my palms. Yep, yep, I think we'll be okay. See, your worthless safety hood wood really wasn't important, was it? It's actually right in the way, so maybe you should just get rid of that and quit putting it under the hood of the car. Anyway, let's get a battery in here. Let's see what this thing will actually do. This guy never actually tightens battery cables either. As long as they go on there and touch, they're good enough. The second you start tightening those things, they break and they don't work. And we don't know if the car even runs yet or drives, so that's a later us issue for sure. 
Now, the fact we didn't even get a spark when we put the battery in is a good sign with all the mice that were working away in here. And oh boy, we got headlights, we got buzzers, we got bingers. Let's try to do something here. Non-electrical issues is a good place to start. I guess we're not starting it again either. It's probably important that we disconnect the gas line. Fuel pump's probably already in trouble because the people at the auction house did say they tried to start it and it didn't run. So that means, I'm just guessing here, they turned it over and ruined the fuel pump with all the nasty gas that was in the tank. But this guy's gonna find himself a container. He's gonna put the fuel line in there and see if the pump actually pumps. Ah. Oh, Ooh. okay. That coil. That co and if you didn't catch that right there, he actually just learned a good lesson on, yes, the coil definitely does work. It jumps a spark all the way over to the valve cover, actually. And when you grab it with your bare hand, it feels really good. Makes you tingle on the inside. Um, is that? Hmm. The battery, I guess, is getting weak. Oh, that's hot. Let's go learn it all the hard way. How about we put some actual gas in here at Guy and see if it actually runs. Sure. I'll be quiet for a little bit. I think it's gonna run. We just need to get fuel into it. And uh, we're not pumping any fuel out of the tank. All right, winning. Going Good thing you didn't tighten those posts and you keep a couple batteries around, ya hoarden. Anyway, he's gonna throw another battery in here. We're gonna give it another shot. Okay, hit it again. <laughs> That's not a good cloud. Woohoo! <laughs> this is quite the nasty cloud of ugly, ugly rust sauce. Yeah. <laughs> Remember those discussions we had, guy, about how you don't breathe the best and how this is affecting us? Maybe killing some brain cells in time to time. Maybe we've done too much of it over a lot of years. Anyway, we actually got some gas to pull out of the tank, and oh boy, does it look bad. That's not the right color for gas, and it smells something like turpentine. Having a borescope lying around is a pretty good investment. This one was a cheapy one off of the Amazon. We're gonna check out and see how bad the inside of that tank is and see if there's any good gas in there. And oh boy, there is not. I know what's wrong with it. Ain't no gas in it. Why is that funny? I think that's one of the stupidest things ever. It's odd to me the things that the internet makes funny. But trying to understand the internet is like trying to understand anything else. It's next to impossible because stupidity makes it really hard because, oh, never mind. Let's just go back to working on the car. What's this guy doing anyway? We're changing the oil. Good thought. Now that we know it will run, if we want to let it run for any period of time, it's a good idea to have proper lubricant in there. And this saucy black water is not up to the task. Now it is good to note it's a good black fuely blend, which means we don't have any water in there. It's very important because we don't like cars that sat around and froze the block and got coolant in where the oil lives. Never a good thing. It's always good at this point to point out when putting your oil plug back in any vehicle, you never have to over tighten it. You just have to tighten it enough for it to stay in there and not leak fluid. I don't know why it has to be said, but there I said it. 
Now, keyboard warriors, before you say a word, yes, I know it's a Fram, I know it's not a premium filter, we do put premium filters on things we like, but we don't even know if this car will shift into gear yet. And we're gonna throw this thing away in about 500 miles when we change this nasty oil again, so calm down. And also, all the people that are gonna jump in here and say, Fram filters are just fine. They are. If you choose to spend less money and change your oil yourself, just do it more often and you'll probably be fine. Premium filters are premium for a reason. We're not going to argue about it. Moving on. Here's this guy again, sticking his hands in things he doesn't need to be sticking his hands in. He just likes to feel the grittiness on his fingers. I guess that's how you learn. Maybe he's learning something. I don't think he is. I think this is a good way to get some kind of disease. Just keep putting your hands in liquids they don't need to be in. Just, just keep doing what you're going to do. I can't stop you. Now the idea here is the damage has probably already been done to that pump, so I guess we're going to throw an inline filter in so we can kind of monitor the fuel flow. We can see when the fuel's coming in, and we can see what actually is coming out of that tank. The bore scope told us it's a little crusty in there, but it's probably not that bad. Hopefully, cross your fingers, it'll come back to bite us, I'm sure. Has anybody ever thought about why we still even have straight blade anything? Like a straight screwdriver is primarily used for prying at this point. Most bolts that have a straight head, I mean, that's some archaic medieval stuff, right? I mean, why do we still do it? It shouldn't even be a thing. Why that once we didn't come out with the next thing, that stopped being a thing? Are we just like preserving an older idea? I don't know, it's things I think about a lot whenever I'm turning a straight head screw. But back to this guy, he's putting gas in a fuel tank, cause why not? Side note here, this is one of those hidden gas caps behind a weird door, it makes for a really weird angle. The fact they made this thing flip up so you had to get a crazy funnel to even get in there was probably a horrible idea on their point. Way to go, Mercury engineers. Ruining a perfectly good feature because you couldn't just do it right to begin with. Stop. I gotta give it some gas. Well, I don't have any gas yet, but it's starting to fill the filter. I should probably just put some in the carb. I just don't have any gas left to put in the carb. Put off the starter. And idle. Noise. You just kept cranking the starter the whole time, didn't you? All right, tempted that to you, don't worry. But like second it starts running, you gotta, you gotta stop cranking it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I did not give proper direction. So there's a brake light on. We know why that is. You might wanna. You're gonna stop idling. Got a lot of valve train noise, but it's gonna get real smoky in here real fast, so you may just want to open some doors. <laughs> Check out that perfect pour. Gotta put that coolant in without a funnel, because if you use a funnel, that proves you're not a true car guy, I bet. And that's the way we think around here anyway. Well, maybe it's just because the funnel's clear over there. It is important to have the proper amount of coolant when you're letting the motor heat cycle to reseat all them rings. Now just remember, even though you're not moving forward or back, it's a good idea to have the right amount of transmission fluid in there. So just check her, add a little bit. And on one of these, it's a Ford, so it takes type F. And that is important, and don't let anybody tell you any different. 
You'll trash a lot of transmissions. Don't put that F in there. Well, that's at least what an old man told me a long time ago, and I could probably go read the internet and prove myself wrong, but I'm not gonna. That's why I put these things on the internet like I do, so you can tell me I'm wrong. That's your responsibility. Yep, that's why I do this. Whoa! We didn't catch that right there. A little bit of foot pedal action got us a little bit of brakes back, or so we think. It definitely does stop the car slightly in neutral, as long as you're not forcing the pedal. The decision to take it outside tested a few things, tested the ability for the transmission to go in and out of gear, and it also removed some of the smoke from the garage, slowly killing us. Yeah, all good decisions. Now it's time to just let her sit and idle, check all them fluids again, maybe pump the brakes, add a little brake fluid, hopefully get that to come back around, and just let the smoke become one with the sky. If you see what this guy is doing here, he's got one of them fancy little infrared heat lasers and he's checking the heat at the thermostat and the intake and all the accessory things to make sure nothing's turning nuclear. Way to just cut me off with that glorious room room from that two barrel. Oh boy, is she running good. Now there is some noises to be addressed here and as you notice as we're backing in, there's a pool of liquid on the floor. Well, that's coming out of the power steering system and that's just an issue we're not willing to look at right now. The pump is empty, and it's not happy, and it's leaking pretty good. So we're going to throw some fluid in there and just keep letting that happen until we make everything else work. And now that we know it's running, let's do a little cleaning on the inside, because oh boy is it disgusting in there. And let's go a little CSI Miami again and catalog this crime scene. Evidence catalog number one, one well-used Civil War era hammer. Possible blood on the head, check on that later. Catalog item number two, glove. Catalog item number three, slightly used, less than pristine, undergarments of a man. Glove box tools, everything's worth it now. We gotta remember the glove box tools. These three things make all of this worth doing. Years of junk paperwork, ugh, worthless, all worthless, tells us nothing. Possible new car part, air cleaner. We need one of these, so cross your fingers. Junk. 100% junk. Just as dirty as the one we already had. Why keep this in the back seat? This is an odd keep item for sure. Nothing surprising here. This was owned by a farmer in Iowa. There has to be at least one piece of farm-related equipment in the vehicle. Cocktail! Tom Cruise motion picture cassette. Winning! Just what I always wanted, my own little mousy. I will name him George, and I will hug him and pet him and kiss him. All right, sanity check. Back to working on the car. This thing's filthy, and we're going to throw all this stuff away. Now, all these items are weird because there's no other items. They're by themselves. This, this is serial killer stuff right here. I'm just going to say it. Now, I really want you to take this in as we clean out all this junk that came out of the glove box that is on the floor and really just smell it with your eyes if you can. Just really let those eyes weep with the odor and the essence of all that is in front of us. Yes, the enjoyable cotton candy fluff on the inside of the seats. Just really bring it in your nostrils and just let you just, mmm, oh yeah, it's good. It's really good. Now, if you're into car detailing, this is, well, not for you, because we could have done better. We're not doing better. We're doing okay. It's, when we're done, we'll be able to sit in it. And, well, on a hot day, it'll be just as bad as it is right now. Uh, to do this correctly, we need to rip out absolutely everything. I mean, who really invited all these mice anyway? But, uh, to say the least, we don't have major electrical issues that we know of up to this point. Just, just a lot of fecal matter. I do not know how many mice were invited to this mouse house party, but there was a lot of them, and everything was a bathroom. You know, mice are bad to a car. Everyone thinks they're just horrible little rodents that tear up your interior, and they do. But you know what's worse than a mouse? A raccoon. A raccoon getting in your car is the absolute worst. Ask me how I know, because raccoons will literally pull open the steel of a floorboard, climb up inside, and tear the seat down to the literal springs, and then poop, 
right in the middle. And that's and they'll live in there and they'll just be happy. And you won't be happy, but they'll be happy. Back to what we were doing. Now we're scrubbing the floor, not because it makes it cleaner, it just, just deodorizes some of it. Just gets down in there and tries to break out some of the odors of what's going on in this car. Can you tell where this guy messed up right here? He did all that vacuuming and cleaning and then forgot about the glove box. And you know, now that glove box is all stuffed. So you guys take the vacuum in there and he's got to get it all out before it ends up all over the floor again that he just cleaned. But we all know that he's not really cleaning anything anyway. He's just kind of running at a brick wall because he knows everything he's doing right now has no real purpose. It doesn't make the car cleaner. It just makes the car tolerable. It makes it so you can get in the car and drive down the street and only smell slightly bad when it's over and your nostrils will be penetrated with all the bad odors of many many years of mice and rodents and things and well you know that's just where we're at um it's feeling better about sitting on the seat and not feeling like you have to burn your clothes every time you get in and out of it now if we wanted to actually do this correctly the right thing to do would be to unbolt the seat remove it from the car completely remove the actual carpet remnant altogether this one having a lot of holes in it it just get rid of it all the seats are now torn up realistically the covers are good but the padding is gone on. These things are just going to be sacked out. So that's where all this stuffing came from. It comes from the carpet mat. It comes from the seats. Every time these mice get in there and do this, it ruins everything. It's not just an odor and a smell and a filth. It's ruining of all the internal components of the actual interior potential wiring we really got to rip out the dash you got to remove the headliner you got to remove everything you can clean this and lie to yourself and tell you that it's a clean car we scrubbed the seats and we cleaned the carpet but the reality of it is there's nothing bringing this back outside of full replacement a lot of the fabrics and then a true deep cleaning all the way down to the metal Let's go back to the crazy will it run that we're pulling off here. Now, this is the air cleaner. We're going to put a new air cleaner in there. Amazing. But the craziest part about all of this is we actually found a crankcase filter. I know, right? You would think that they wouldn't even carry those anymore, and they kind of don't. This was the last one they had in the store. And when's the last time you actually replaced a crankcase filter in an air cleaner? Yeah, not very often. And there's a lot of people that have probably never seen one of these or ever replaced one of them. And I'm only doing it because, hey, it was two bucks. I can actually monitor how much oil is being fed back up into this thing. It's a good idea if you want to do it. If you don't and you want to just plug that off, that's entirely up to you. But I'm going back to factory spec here, and that's what we're doing. Now you can bet your biscuits that this thing had a longer little stem there and I'd be putting her in upside down race mode. But we don't got one of those, so we're just going to have to put her in factory format setting. Now it's always a good idea whenever you have a car that has upcaps on it. It's a good idea to pop those upcaps off and actually see if it has all of the lug nuts or if they're tight. Or any number of things that could be going on behind that hidden cap of doom. Now for us, we were taking these off anyway to actually address the brakes and look at a few things. But I'm glad I pulled them before I decided to just chance the brake system and hope it worked. Because the amount of non-balanced tire due to heavy amounts of silted dirt being inside of there would have been dramatic. And this car would have driven horrifically. And I would have thought things were way worse than what they actually are just by the wobbly wobbly wobbly. Check this guy out. Did you give him a can of spray lubricant and he thinks he needs to re-lubricate the whole tire like he can somehow bring back all that old rubber. But I would like to point out again that these tires are still not dry rotted even though they're 20 plus years old. I think the EPA has definitely messed up what they're doing with tires. I get they need to break down. We gotta throw them away somehow, right? But I like the tires to last on my car a little longer than five years. They even tell you right now you're supposed to get ready to after like six years or something. I don't know. You can fact check me on that but tires aren't good that's my point and and these tires although very old they're still holding air and they still have rubber. 
I don't know if you're catching the amount of wobble in that steering system as we're trying to take this tire off here, but it's not good. I'm guessing the tire in the trunk probably had a little bit of death wobble. That's why it was all bald on the inside. And by the tire receipt, it actually got a new set of tires, which is potentially these front ones, but probably not because they don't look like they got that much tread on them. But this tire comes off really hard. We have to actually clean the hub on both these tires because it's just nasty on there. Because silted dirt coming in the side of a hub cap where water can't get in and actually wash it out over 20 years doesn't do great things to things. Glory be, the brakes actually turned. We knew things actually turned, and these rotors actually look really, really good. They got a lot of surface rust on them, but they're not destroyed. This whole brake system looks like it was actually gone through not that long before it was parked, which is great. Um, sometimes old brake systems will seize up and not be good. Sometimes brand new brake systems will seize up and not be good. This one seems to be rotating at least. And by having all new components, I don't feel like I have to replace them all right now, at least as far as we can tell. And by the fact that the bleeder actually came out of the car is a good sign that it didn't see a lot of road grime in the state of Iowa. Because if it would have been left in the car and driven through at least one winter, there's a good chance it probably never would have come out of there. It actually came out very easy and just had light surface rust on it that was easily cleaned off and blow right through there. She's a good bleeder reinsert so we can start trying to bleed this thing because we need to bleed at least the front brakes for you know road safety reasons if you have good front disc brakes it'll overcome any non-working back brakes well at low speed anyway but we want to try to give it a little bit of guarantee that we can stop can you take a break Liquid on the floor. Liquid. What? Oh. Cylinder, it won't push fluid. So yeah. instead of pushing fluid out to where it should be pushing fluid, it's pushing fluid into the car. Yep. Hmm. Time for a master cylinder. Yep. Now you think this guy would learn wear a pair of gloves, do anything else, and bash your hands on things? Maybe not position your hand on a wrench where it's going to punch something. But, you know, that's how you learn, but he never has, and that's why his hands are all gnarled up. But, you know, lesson to everyone else watching. Uh, watch the position of your hands so you don't punch heavy metal objects. We broke a lot of knuckles on this job, and it wasn't because we were doing it the right way. And anytime you see a guy using gloves in a mechanic setting, don't be like, oh, nice gloves. No, respect the fact that he probably just enjoys having the skin on his hands and working knuckles. It doesn't make you any less of a man because you can think about things like hey maybe i need to use my hands maybe my whole life maybe not ruin them in my 30s now if you were paying attention to what was going on back there before i went on that rant about hands and gloves and you know, respecting people or whatever we were talking about there um the actual plunger that pushes the master cylinder came out with the master cylinder that shouldn't happen but we got it all cleaned up and then reinstalled and we cleaned the actual booster too Look how pretty that looks. Now on to a newly discovered problem. You know that slop we had in the wheels when we were taking the tires off? Well, we actually figured out what it is, and it's the rag joint, or lack of the rag joint. It's not actually attached really in any way. It's just kind of slamming back and forth in there, and that'll be really bad if we try to drive it down the road. Now, this thing didn't come out very easy, as you can tell. We had to do a lot of manipulating to get it apart. This thing completely fell apart as it was coming out, and we had to actually go inside the car and remove the whole column. I really thought the column would collapse a little bit to allow me to get this rag joint out, but I was very much wrong. Now, there could be something wrong with this column. I'm not going to look into it far enough to find out. In my mind, it should have collapsed, but it didn't. I had to pull the whole column to get it to come out. There's potential that it's just rusty. Um, that's neither here nor there. It's not a problem. We just worked around it. Uh, traditionally, I wouldn't think you'd have to do that, but that's what we had to do. Somebody in the comments could probably tell me I'm wrong, and I would enjoy the fact of actually knowing, because I'm not going to waste the time to look it up. Because we. 
Anyway, you can see that the old one came out in literal pieces, and the new one, looking like this, is a way better unit. Now, there's things I don't like about the new one, and I'm actually going to use pieces from the old one added to the new one, because there's things about the new one that are just aren't as strong and girthy and good. So, we'll just use parts from the old with the new to make it better. Is it crazy to you that you can go into a parts store these days and I get 1978 was a ways back? Okay, that's classic country back there. And, well, you can't buy parts for things out of the 90s anymore, let alone things out of the 70s. So, here we are. We bought and ordered parts. We couldn't get those parts for quite a few days, and it was simple stuff, like a master cylinder and a rag joint. These are not things that are really changed out that much anymore so i understand that they don't carry those products maybe carry one on hand just blow the dust off it on the shelf i mean come on i found a crankcase filter but i couldn't get a master cylinder that's just crazy to me and just like that, the rag joint is reinstalled better than ever, strong as it could be. Still doesn't fix the fact that we have a power steering system that is failing due to another $200 part I can't buy, but that's neither here nor there. We need to make sure it drives before we go down that rabbit hole. Now, not to skip too many steps on you here, but this isn't really a how-to. We bench bled the master cylinder, and now we're reinstalling it. And then, after that, weird, we're actually going to bleed the front brakes again. You're not going to see it on here because, well, it's just unnecessary. You know how to bleed brakes. You get yourself, a, well... Well, you get yourself a wife, and you have a kid, and then you have the kid pump the brake, and then you hold the pedal, and then it purges up. Never mind. That's, I mean, you can buy tools to bleed brakes, I guess, but that's it. it's a good father-son activity. That's my point, though. I mean, really, that is it. Um, yeah. Bleeding brakes. You don't get to see it. But you do get to see me install these sweet white wall tires. And guess what? I cleaned the wheels because I like wasting time and energy and water. And I got all the mud out of them. And there was a lot of mud. And we got that all cleaned off there so we could slam these wheels back on. Now, this whole time before we had the wheels off, or, well, we had the wheels off, I guess would be the right way to say it, we were actually soaking all the lug nuts in some oil. So when they went back on, they'd go just on there real nice. I like to soak nuts in oil because it penetrates the steel. And I also like to say nuts and penetrate and... Well, here we are. We're almost time for that glorious first test drive. The car is back on the ground and we're getting ready to roll out. Now, this is where I should probably put in some inspirational music, uh, but I've kind of been working on this video a while, and my mentalities, the momentals, are getting a little in flux, so we're just gonna have to go. Dun, 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 dun. Car. No, 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 no. Mercury. No, 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 no. Smells like mice. Woohoo! And we're gonna drive around and we're gonna ponder on what it is to own a Mercury Monarch. The feelings, the wonders, the comfort. Is it better than a Benz? Is it better than the 70s Mercedes? I don't. I don't know, because I don't own a 70s Mercedes. I don't own a Benz, so I guess I was the wrong guy to ask the whole time. I mean, it's kind of weird. You know, I was comparing it to something I've never driven. I've driven one of these, though, now. and It's like anything else out of the 70s, if you think about it. It, it was underpowered. It was comfortable. It doesn't quite fit me. I'm a little too big for it, almost, realistically. And uh, it drives okay. This one needs a lot. It needs a lot more things. I'm not really sure what to do with it at this point. Uh, we bought it because it was there. Uh, it was cheap. Uh, I don't really know why we do a lot of things. There's a lot of uh, influx when it comes to decision making and investments. This is not a good investment. All cars are pretty much bad investments. If you waste your money on these things, it's not about what you're getting back out of it. I mean, I guess you have a car you can drive, but at the end of the day, this isn't a great car. No one's going to, you know, compare it to anything new. Uh, they can enjoy it. It is a good platform. You have a V8. You have rear-wheel drive. If you want to get into a low-budget build of having a rear-wheel drive V8 car that maybe isn't as cute and beautiful as everybody else's, Mercury Monarch. That's what I can sell you right here, is it's not pretty, but it's a car. And on top of that, when people look at you, they think, wow, that's probably third generation welfare money right there. 
There's probably a five-year-old in the back seat getting cigarette burns from the 4x60 AC option. Child support checks that haven't come in because, well, we don't know who the father is. That's the image you scream when driving a 1978 Mercury Monarch. Or this is the car you double down as a young man or woman and you think, oh, that's a good good value on a car that I can drive and fix myself and maybe I'm a hipster and have a mustache that I curl on the ends and I'm gonna put butterflies on it because the name says monarch and I just think that's cute and neat anyway this is a story of triumph we made it we made a car run after 20 years just abandoned lost farm barn find car of victory or maybe not Maybe it's just a car that we bought, we didn't need, that we spent money on, and still needs a lot of work. Maybe it just died. Maybe it doesn't run right now. Maybe if you buy a car like this and you think it's a good idea to take up this hobby and go out and make something run again, will it run? It's a barn find. Maybe you should buy good walking boots. Boots that carry your legs well, that are comfortable and strong. Because guess what? You're going to be doing some walking go back and get the truck to tow this thing home because you know small victories are like anything else it takes a lot of battles to win a war but sometimes the war isn't worth fighting so you tell us is this war worth fighting should we keep going with this or should we just deem it a yard art and uh pick it of parts someday i don't know you tell me hey thanks for coming and uh Mercury Monarch, it's a car.